For many, this referendum on an Indigenous voice to Parliament feels like it's been a long time coming. And that's because for a long time, Australia's Indigenous people have been fighting for some sort of recognition, as well as the ability to make decisions about things that affect them. So, to find out how we ended up here, let's go back to the start, with my comprehensive guide of almost everything that has happened so far in Australia to get us to where we are now that you probably need to know before the referendum. Is that really the title of this video? It's very long. The story goes that in 1770, Captain Cook arrives on the east coast of Australia at a little old place that we now know as Botany Bay. From reading his detailed journals, we know that Cook had a bit of a look around, interacted with the local Gweagle people, gave them some beads, before sticking a flag in the ground and declaring the land for the British Crown. More or less. Ah. Cook declared the country terra nullius, or land belonging to no one. And while many would see that as a great example of imperialism and the British Empire expanding its rule, uh, this land already belonged to someone, or rather it belonged to the many First Nations groups that make up this country, each with their own languages, laws, customs and ways of looking after their land and their people. Cook left Australia with his crew to tell everyone back home about this abundance of land he'd, uh, discovered. And then, before you knew it, it was 1788, and the first fleet arrived here with the two seas, colonists and convicts, who began to well, colonise and take control over the land. Now, I want to pause here and quickly mention that it's at this point that you might expect a treaty to be negotiated. That's a legally binding contract or agreement between two parties and can be quite useful in establishing a relationship with Indigenous populations. For example, when New Zealand was colonised by the Brits, the Treaty of Waitangi was established. It was signed in 1840 between the British Crown and about 540 Maori chiefs, who agreed that New Zealand would become a British colony as long as they got to keep certain rights. Many other countries also established treaties with its indigenous people when their lands were colonised, but uh, not Australia. In the years that followed the first fleet arriving, the settlers did what they do best, settle. They made their way across the country, establishing six colonies, which resulted in many conflicts between Indigenous and non-Indigenous as competition for land grew. Thousands of First Nations people were killed by the colonisers in massacres known as the Frontier Wars. Meanwhile, diseases like smallpox and measles, which were brought over by the settlers, spread and killed thousands more. By the turn of the century, the British colonies had become pretty well established. Conversations and negotiations started about combining those six colonies to make one big colony, Australia. And in 1901, that happened in a process known as Federation. Sydney, the site of the first permanent settlement on our continent, celebrated the creation of the Commonwealth of Australia. Along with becoming a federation, Australia also got itself a constitution, which is sort of like a rule book for how the country is run. And so what did it say about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I hear you ask? Surprise, not much. When it was first written, only two sections, section 51 and section 127, referred to Australia's First Nations peoples. These sections stated that the Commonwealth could not make laws concerning Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and that they weren't to be counted in the census. Which basically meant that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people weren't recognised as part of the Australian population, and that it was up to each state and territory to make decisions about them. In the years that followed Federation, more people migrated from overseas, helping to populate the country, making it the multicultural society we know today. Meanwhile, Australia's First Nations peoples continued to be removed from their land, forced to work in harsh conditions with little to no pay, and segregated from the rest of Australia's growing population. Meanwhile, thousands of children were taken away from their families and their homes and placed in missions or foster care. They're known as the Stolen Generations. In 1938, on the 26th of January, a group of Aboriginal activists held a day of mourning 
This is considered the first major protest by Indigenous people, and the starting point for the National Aborigines and Islander Day Observance Committee, aka NADOC, which was officially formed in 1957 with the aim of drawing attention to Indigenous people. Perhaps it worked, because by the 1960s, people's perspectives were starting to change. And the fight for First Nations peoples to have more rights was growing momentum, with many activists doing what they could to get their message out there. A lot of Australians talk about, oh yes, we, we want to give the Aboriginal a fair go, then it's full stop and it's usually forgotten. They never go on to saying, look, we've proposed that we give such and such a scholarship to a number of Aborigines. Let us support Aboriginal organisation. Let us vote in favour of any legislation which allows for the elevation of the Aboriginal people. They don't do these things. They talk about it, but they never do it. 1962 saw all Indigenous people given the right to vote in Commonwealth elections. And five years later, in 1967, a referendum was held to alter the two sections of the Constitution I previously mentioned. The referendum asked Australians whether or not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be counted as citizens, and the country agreed. The 67 referendum is considered a significant step towards acknowledging the rights of Indigenous Australians, but the fight for equality was far from over. Moving into the 70s, and there were some more major moments. Neville Thomas Bonner became the first Indigenous member of an Australian parliament in 1971. What do you feel can be gained by being part of the political establishment as you are? Uh, first and foremost, uh, whoever is in government uh, surely are going to be conscious that uh, there is an Ab Aborigine sitting within the parliament. I think that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, uh, there is much that an Aborigine can do uh, in talking to parliamentary colleagues uh, from either side of the house. In 1972, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy was established on the lawns of Parliament House in Canberra. It became a symbol of Indigenous activism and a rallying point for Indigenous rights. Oh, and it's still there today, making it the longest continuous protest for Indigenous land rights in the world. During the 70s, nearly 200 years after Captain Cook landed, people were finally talking about a treaty. And at this point, every colonised Indigenous group in the Commonwealth had one. Oh, except Australia. It was around this time that the National Aboriginal Conference was set up by the government to be a sort of voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This group travelled around the country consulting with different Indigenous groups and presented a report to the federal government with a bunch of recommendations, including a treaty, or as they referred to it, a makarata, which is a Yonu word meaning the end of a dispute between communities and the resumption of normal relations. But uh, not much came of it. And in 1985, the Prime Minister at the time, Bob Hawke, stopped treaty negotiations and withdrew funding from the National Aboriginal Conference. Despite this, Bob Hawke was still supportive of some sort of recognition. In 1988, Aboriginal leaders presented to Bob Hawke something called the Barunga Statement. Painted during the Barunga Sport and Cultural Festival, it's a significant document that is the result of years of engagement and discussion between Aboriginal groups in the Northern Territory and the Australian Government. It called on the Government to make a whole heap of changes, as well as negotiate a, you guessed it, treaty, to which Bob Hawke responded with, There shall be a treaty. Spoiler alert, that didn't happen. But the Barunga Statement is still hung up at Parliament House, so that's nice. Now we're in the 90s, and while the calls for a treaty are still lingering around, the government has sort of switched its focus to reconciliation, setting up the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation in 1991. As their title would suggest, their job was to reconcile the complicated history between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Easy. <laughs> oh. OK, so not super easy, but in the years that followed, there were some pretty big steps forward. <laughs> in 1992, the Prime Minister at the time, Paul Keating, made the now famous Redfern speech. We took the traditional lands and smashed the traditional way of life. We brought the diseases and the alcohol. We committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. We practice discrimination and exclusion. It was the first time a Prime Minister publicly addressed and acknowledged the devastating impact colonisation had on Australia's First Peoples. 
That same year, the Mabo decision was made. The High Court has recognised there were people here and their descendants have rights. That was when Merriam man Eddie Mabo convinced Australia's High Court to finally recognise that his people had legal rights to the land they'd lived on for thousands of years. It was huge and led to another big win, the Native Title Act of 1993, which recognised and protects Indigenous rights to land and water. The 90s also saw a big investigation into the stolen generations. And for the first time, Aussies heard what sort of an impact it had had. I was born under the Act, I was stolen under that Act, and I had something really bad happen to me because of my son under the Act, and my son now suffers under that Act. Towards the end of the 90s, the notion of a document for reconciliation was buzzing about as an alternative to a treaty. But uh, once again, the Prime Minister at the time said no. The other thing I'd like to stress is the fulsome commitment of my government to the process of reconciliation. He uh, is entrenched in his position. He wishes to remain known as a stubborn person. Well, let him go down in history as a stubborn person. The 2000s kicked off with a massive march across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It had been organised by the Reconciliation Council and there were similar walks held around the country. Eight years later, the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd made a formal apology to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, particularly to the Stolen Generations, whose lives had been blighted by past government policies of forced child removal and assimilation. On behalf of the Parliament of Australia, I am sorry. Mr Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. Another eight years later and the government set up the Referendum Council. Their job was to advise the Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition on options for constitutional reform. And in 2017 they held a National First Nations Constitutional Convention at Uluru where after days of negotiations, they presented this, something I'm sure you're all familiar with, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Amongst other things, it calls for a makarata, or treaty. I'm noticing a trend here. As well as a constitutionally enshrined Indigenous voice to Parliament. And while the Turnbull government rejected these requests, in 2022, the current Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, said, yeah, let's give it a go, and announced the referendum. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, this has been a marathon. For all of us, it is now a sprint. Today I announce that Referendum Day will be the 14th of October. So, there you have it. A comprehensive guide of almost everything important that has happened in Australia so far to get us to where we are now that you probably need to know before the referendum. You know, I think we could really come up with a shorter title. Why don't we just call it Road to Referendum? Or Aboriginal History, that makes sense, that says it all. Yeah.